Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, past, present, sometimes future. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the soon-to-be-forthcoming McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, due out December 13th, just a couple of weeks from now. I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts. Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. Um, He also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which has tons of Beatles-related interviews, so you should check them all out. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Good, Alan. I can't wait for your book. I can't wait for it either. I have not seen a physical copy yet. You're kidding me. No. No. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area. He's been there since 1984, February 1984. If you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. So today... Today is the 21st anniversary, as we record this, of uh, George Harrison's passing. And so um, our show today, uh, what, we've de- what we've decided to do is each do a two CD set of the best, or however we each may want to describe it, of George Harrison. And uh, we will get to our sequences in a few minutes. But first, we have the news from Ken. Ken? All right. Thank you, Alan. Unfortunately, we start off the show with news about several major passings. First of all, we have Jeff Wanfor, Mm. who directed the Beatles anthology series. In 1997, Jeff won a Grammy Award for Best Music Video for the eight-part series, which chronicled the history of the band. He spent five years working on the project. And he said he found one of the challenges was to interweave interviews from John Lennon, considering the fact that he died in 1980. He's quoted as saying, I hit on the idea of listening to his interviews that were done getting all the pertinent questions and answers to any year we were doing in the documentary, and then posed the exact same question to the other three Beatles. So it looked like the four of them were answering the same questions, which of course they were. End of quote there. Uh, Wanfer also worked with Paul McCartney on a number of his videos, including directing and producing the documentary In the World Tonight on the making of Paul's Flaming Pie album. And he co-produced the video for Paul's Live at the Cavern Club concert as well. So maybe you saw him there since you were at the Cavern during that concert, Alan. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I interviewed him during the, uh, the anthology time as well. So Oh, wow. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Um, it was a long time ago. I'm not sure I remember, <laughs> but he was like a big burly guy, um, yeah. the Scottish accent. And, um, you know, he he the quote you read sounds exactly like the way he was. You know, he was very methodical about putting the anthology together and he knew what he wanted. I got the impression that he found it sort of a, an interesting balancing act to deal with all of their stories separately, which were not always identical. You know, John mm. jammed with Elvis, the others didn't jam with, you know, like <laughs> that. Um, and, and then interviewing them all together. And and he was, uh, was very sort of laid back. He seemed to be sort of amused by the differences of, of memory. And uh, yeah, you know, and we all saw the product of what he did, which was, uh, you know, an incredible series. I, I, I'd like to watch that again soon. Sure. Wow. I wonder how he was chosen to be the director. I don't know. It's such an honorable job there to take Mm -hmm. part in something this historic. Yeah. But um, also, Wanfer was known for directing the 80s pop show called The Tube and a music video for Band-Aid 20 in 2004. Wanfer was 73. We also mourn the passing of Ken Mansfield. 
And Ken worked in the promotions department at Capitol Records and also was in charge of promoting and overseeing the singles and albums for the Beatles Apple label. He was a guest on our show. If you ever want to check that out, that's show number 290. And I also interviewed him prior to that two times. He was one of the lucky few that was on the Apple rooftop when the Beatles gave their performance there. Known for wearing a white coat at that uh, at that event, sitting next to Yoko, Maureen, and Chris O'Dell. After working with the Beatles, Ken worked for Andy Williams' record label, Barnaby Records, and then he worked for MGM Records, also as a record producer, and he worked with various artists who were part of the outlaw movement. Mansfield wrote uh, several books with Beatles content, including The Beatles, The Bible, and Bodega Bay, A Long and Winding Road. That was in the year 2000. The White Book, The Beatles, The Bands, The Biz, An Insider's Look at an Era, 2007 for that. And The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert in 2018. I know Darren wrote something really nice on his Facebook page as a tribute to Ken. Any thoughts about uh, our interview and our time with him? It just struck me that, you know, that we had interviewed him and we were all so fascinated to hear the stories about uh, the concert, the rooftop performance. And and now all of a sudden he's gone. I mean, uh, it was sad. And it's sad when these little pieces of Beatle history go away. So. so yeah, obviously. Yeah. You know, I can remember there's certain stories that he repeats in his interviews, but um, that he met the Beatles, I believe, when they played the Hollywood Bowl concert in 64. And I think that they got along with him really well because he was closer in age to them. He was only a few years older than they were. And uh, certain things like um, Paul being very worried about the Hey Jude single. Not that he didn't love the song and be proud of it but he was worried that the fact that it was so long that radio stations wouldn't play it and ken had to uh call in order to to uh to reassure paul he called certain uh big big name program directors at the time in top 40 radio and sent them advanced copies of hey jude and got feedback from them and they all loved it and then ken went back to paul with it but um you know, things like that. He did tell me uh, in the first interview that I that um, that I did with him that Ringo stayed in contact with him. And because he was working with these outlaw artists, Ringo, as you know, loves country music. And and Ringo asked Ken to send him vinyl copies of the latest albums from people like Waylon Jennings. Mm. So, you know, this made you realize, of course, country music has always been a part of Ringo's life and mm. so I found that to be really interesting he also told me as as someone who followed country music that Blue Coos of Blues was kind of well respected in the the country community even though it wasn't a big selling album the public was aware and country artists were aware that Ringo made it but uh really nice guy and uh very sad uh, to hear of his loss of, of losing him Okay. Um, also, a friend of the Beatles in their early years, Dennis Littler, just passed away. There's a very familiar photo. Should have brought it here. Um, actually, the first color photo of the Beatles, taken March 8th, 1958. Then the Quarrymen, taken by Paul's brother, Michael, that we've all seen of John, Paul, and George with their guitars in a hallway. It had Dennis all the way to the right of the photo, wearing glasses and holding a half pint glass of Guinness. The occasion for this photo was Paul's 19-year-old cousin, Ian Harris, was getting married, and the quarry men were asked to provide some music for the wedding reception. Ian's mother just happened to be Paul's Auntie Jen. And Ian's best friend was Dennis Littler, who was also a guitarist, had his own band, and according to what Dennis once said to the Daily Express, the quarry men sometimes rehearsed at Auntie Jin's house, and they looked up to him and his band and even pleaded if they could join his group. Mm -hmm. Dennis said no at the time because they were too young and too inexperienced, and they were still at school. And Dennis said uh, they all wanted to borrow his more expensive and better guitar, the uh, Antonia Acoustic. 
With his passing, Mike McCartney posted the photo and tweeted, sad to hear that the lovely lad to the right of my photo has passed away. At least he will now be able to say hi to George and Johnny. Hmm. There have been times when this photo has been shown with Dennis's picture being cropped out. But if you've seen the photo, as I'm sure just about every Beatle fan has, he's the guy all the way to the right there with John, Paul, and George. Dennis Littler. And we just learned right before recording our show that Henry Grossman has passed away. And he was a friend of, of Alan, so. Yeah. Yeah, Henry, uh, Henry was a, a photographer who... In in the Beatles world, I guess we know him largely for, um, well, originally having photographed a night of Sgt. Pepper sessions when they were working on Lucy in the Sky. And quite a few of the shots from that session, you know, probably hundreds of them, uh, are in a book called Kaleidoscope Eyes, which Henry published with Curve Bender. Uh, Curve Bender is the imprint of um, the guys who did the recording the Beatles book and they ran into Henry when they were researching pictures and said well you know got anything else and Henry you know had not only that day of Sgt. Pepper sessions with Lucy in the Sky uh, but he also had photographed them earlier than that and had been to England to see them a few times, photograph them in uh, John's house with uh, their wives and, and kids. Uh, and generally speaking, Brian Epstein's feeling was that pictures like that shouldn't be published. But Henry showed them to him and he thought they were really charming. So he allowed those private pictures with Julian and, and uh, you know, just sort of at home uh, to be published. Also, uh, a, a lot of those pictures and a lot of his pictures that don't have to do with the Lucy sessions are in a book called Places I Remember, also published by Curve Bender. They're both pretty expensive books, um, but like, you know, sort of like the way Genesis books are, but they're beautifully produced and they're really great collections of pictures. Um, and Henry also once interviewed George Harrison, although it wasn't really his interview. He interviewed George Harrison for Oriana Falacci, the Italian journalist. Um, and I've heard the tape of it. Um, uh, she sent the questions. I'm not sure why she couldn't do it herself, but um, she sent the questions. And because Henry and George knew each other, George you know, gave a very relaxed interview. A lot of it was about um, you know, Krishna consciousness and, and his religious philosophy. So uh, Henry was, you know, he was a, a, a really a lovely guy. And uh, he started his career when he was in college and uh, took a, a, a picture of a, a politician. It may have been Kennedy, I'm not sure. And when Kennedy was shot, Henry's pictures of both Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were on the front page of the New York Times. And I think he was only in his 20s at that point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, really, my, my wife came in to tell us this uh, just before we started. And it's uh, it's it's really mm -hmm. I'm kind of sad about it. But if, if you have an opportunity to look at those two books, uh, you should do it. Uh, he, he did the Pepper Sessions because he was photographing the Beatles for Life magazine. And in fact, there's this poster that you see. It's uh, purple and red beetles and purple and red and uh, from around the pepper period. And, um, I would, don't have it with me, but everybody knows what it looks like. That's one of Henry's photos. And the poster is a pirate. He's, he's never been paid for that. Um, but it was take, I think it was originally a cover of, uh, of life magazine, but I think one of the foreign editions, not the American edition. Hmm. All right. Very sad to hear that news. Uh, on we go here. November 25th was Record Store Day, and in addition to several Ringo Starr releases, he also released the new Live at the Greek Theater 2019, which includes a full concert from Ringo and the All-Stars. It's more than two hours, uh, 24 songs in total, 12 from Ringo, 12 from the other All-Stars, all uh, nothing but nonstop hits. You've seen Ringo and the All-Stars. You know how that show goes. This is a killer band, as you know. It's uh, the current band, only instead of Edgar Winter, Greg Raleigh is on keyboards. The concert was released as a two-CD set, also a DVD. 
Blu-ray, um, two CD Blu-ray combo, and a double yellow vinyl release. And I just recorded an interview on my YouTube channel with Joe Thomas, who produced both the audio and the video for this concert. He talked about what the process was like uh, producing and mixing the show and the camera work involved. Really interesting conversation and what it was like to work directly with Ringo and to film this whole thing, supervise it. There's so many different shots and angles that were taken and it's really well done. Uh, I definitely would recommend everyone to watch that. And I certainly hope that it gets some kind of uh, TV exposure. Mm -hmm. Something like this really should be on PBS channels, uh, I would think, certainly for pledge drives and all. And for people who have never seen Ringo and the All-Stars, I think they'll be so impressed watching a, a show like this. Um, also for Record Store Day, Ringo's Old Wave album came out on CD and brown smoky vinyl with uh, a bonus track, the earlier version of the song, As Far As We Can Go, which was also the same bonus track that was on the 1994 CD for Old Wave. Ringo the Fourth came out on vinyl from the Friday Music label, released on both orange, orange and blue labels. Uh, more for the collector, and in this case, this is a very good cause. Ringo Starr is now releasing original limited edition Peace and Love statuettes, which will be sold exclusively at Julian's auctions with proceeds to benefit his charity, the Lotus Foundation, described as life-sized hand artworks of Ringo's iconic peace sign. You will remember that there was an eight foot tall, 800 pound stainless steel statue dedicated to him in Beverly Hills. The new Peace and Love collection consists of 500 original numbered limited edition hand artworks. 250 are stainless steel, 250 are bronze. They are designed and signed by Ringo. <clears throat> They're all housed in a Ringo Peace and Love box and it's accompanied by a certificate of authenticity. Each life-size hand artwork features Ringo's iconic peace symbol, his signature greeting and message to the world for the last five decades. The stainless steel statue goes for $5,000. The bronze ones will sell for $2,000. If you're interested in purchasing these statues, uh, you can go to juliansauctions.com. Uh, Can I just sit in here one second? Sure. How, how many uh, did either one of you, or maybe some folks out there in cyberspace watching this right now, uh, how many people thought of uh, Thing from Adam's family uh, <laughs> when you saw the, the Ringo statues? I would be very concerned if I got one that, like, you know. Anyway, sorry, I'll stop. Well, whoever owns the, the copyrights to the Adams family, they, you just gave them reason to sue. Great. Nice. <laughs> uh. Anyway, um, I can't say thank you enough to John Bazzini and to Jeff Smullyan to learn about a new song from the band Exploring Bird Song. The song is called Ever the Optimist, and it was co-written by Paul McCartney. The band explains, this song certainly has the most interesting backstory to any of the tracks we've written. When in university back in 2018, Linz and Matt were given the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one songwriting session with Sir Paul McCartney. This is the song they took into the session and worked on with Sir Paul himself. It's by far the poppiest song on the record and was the catalyst for centering our songs around synths as well as soul piano parts. You can hear this song on YouTube. You will not see Paul's name listed as a songwriter. So evidently he just let them use his contribution and didn't care whether or not he got a credit. All right. It's, what's it's, the name of the band again? They're called uh, Exploring Bird Song. They're supposed to be a progressive rock band. You listen to it and it doesn't sound like anything that has the hallmarks of a McCartney melody. <laughs> you know, it does, it's not like you'll hear it and you say, oh, that's definitely Paul there. But apparently he contributed to uh, that song. Also, we thank another one of our listeners, Tim Ottaway, to learn that a documentary has been made on the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival show. 
Better known to many fans as Live Peace in Toronto, now to be called Revival 69, the concert that rocked the world. This documentary has been six years in the making. It tells the story how concert promoter John Brower put his life on the line to turn his failing Toronto rock and roll revival into a one day event. With dismal ticket sales, the concert was nearly canceled, but Brower took a one in a million chance and invited John Lennon, who said yes, which propelled the concert into a massively successful event. The concert was performed at the University of Toronto's Varsity Stadium in front of 20,000 fans. Other acts on the bill included Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo Diddley, Gene Vincent, The Doors, and Alice Cooper. Viewers of the documentary will see unreleased concert and backstage footage shot by D.A. Pennebaker. Shortly after performing there, John announced to the other Beatles that he was leaving the group. And this new documentary will open in theaters in select cities in Canada on December the 16th. The film will be released on video on demand in Canada on January 3rd next year. There's no word about uh, being released in the United States or elsewhere. All right. Um, a little bit more here. A very big Beatles landmark has been destroyed. That being the Deauville Hotel in Miami Beach. The Beatles performed there for the Ed Sullivan Show, drawing an estimated audience of 70 million people. Also, President Kennedy gave a speech there for the Young Democrats Convention in 1961. Other celebrities like Frank Sinatra, Tom Jones, and Sammy Davis Jr. performed there. The hotel fell into disrepair and abandonment in recent years. It was closed in 2017 after an electrical fire. Miami Beach officials and the family that owned the hotel sparred over millions of dollars in fines for various code violations. But sad to see that go. A big part of Beatle history there. Okay, just a reminder of a few things. We announced this on our last show. There'll be a special event happening at the Paley Center for the Arts in New York City, December the 7th at 6.30 p.m. Michael Lindsay Hogg, of course, the director of Let It Be, Jonathan Clyde and Rob Sheffield, all will be interviewed by Joe Scarborough of MSNBC, who does the morning show there, Morning Joe. And the Grammy Museum in Newark, uh, New Jersey, having a Beatles exhibit called Ladies and Gentlemen, The Beatles, running now through June 25th. Ken Womack is the curator for it. He already has interviewed May Pang, and he will be interviewing our very own Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair on December the 14th. I do know that unless there's a major snowstorm, <laughs> I intend to be there um, when Alan and Me Adrian too. do their interview as well. So any of you, if you want to be there to see Alan and Adrian, see the rest of the things we said today, uh, co-hosts here. All right. Um, I can also say this since uh, it was announced on Talk More Talk as well, and we're hearing this from a number of reliable sources, but it's not official yet that there's a very good chance we're going to get a Ringo box set next year, an archival box set to mark the 50th anniversary of the Ringo album. So it's so long overdue, we could use some archival box sets from Ringo's catalog, but you kind of figure that one being the most successful would probably be the first one. And I, I certainly hope it's not the only one. But that's it for all the Beatle news I have for you this time. Okay. Wait a minute. Oh, wow. That's supposed it's to backwards. Say, that is backwards. That's supposed to say newsflash. Well, now it's just uh -oh. upside down and backwards. Okay. Get that out of here. Uh, I do have, a, I do have, a, see, I can't, I do have a last minute, a little bit of news that I just found out right before we connected to record the show. I got a notification from paulmccartney.com that the singles box set has been delayed. A week. Uh, I think a week. Yeah. So, so that's what December 9th it'll be. Yeah, and I something don't like have that. the email or I, I think something like that. I think it's just a week. It was the ninth, yeah. Yeah, some yeah. sort of production <clears throat> um thingy. So and I know that uh from a few of our fans that they were told that there'll be a delay in the two C D Blu-ray for Ringo, uh live at the Greek. There's some kind of delay for that. Oh, mm. Don't know how long. I got all the record store day releases, but they were all, 
I found none of them in person hmm. and um, or, or the best of Dark Horse. Uh, nothing in person. Stores I went to were very poorly stocked with record store day titles. I ended up ordering everything online. Um, so all of that, all those goodies are going to be coming in uh, several big boxes. Hmm. In a week. I, got every, I got everything except Ringo the Fourth live at record store day, but I had to go to two places to get it. It turns out that Bull Moose on its website um, for its record store day stuff, um, if you pull up the title that you're looking for, you can then see whether it's in any of the Bull Moose stores and it's linked to their cash register. So if they sell one and it's their last one, the dot will disappear from that store. So um, after we went to the first one that we were going to anyway, uh, I actually found out about this from a guy online, <laughs> you know, not <laughs> online, online, but on the line outside the store. Uh, and uh, I got Old Wave because they didn't have the Greek theater there. I got Old Wave and Dark Horse, but I really wanted the Greek theater. That was the main, that was the main thing I wanted. Uh, so I looked on my app and found another Bomo store where it was, and we drove over there and picked it up. So oh, I thought you were going to say just as soon as you pulled into the parking spot, the dot dis. Oh, I was sitting there with, <laughs> with the phone as we were parking, but yeah, Got yeah. It. I found a, a my very quick, uh, unrelated really to what we're talking or our show. Um, uh, I went to two different Newberry comics. Uh, in in Westchester County, and they were both very poorly stocked, as I mentioned. And somebody had uh, mentioned to me that uh, some stores are, uh, are starting to get concerned about getting stuck with stock that's not selling, mm -hmm. and perhaps that could be why. You know, I walked into uh, <laughs> I walked into Newberry Comics, the first store. I'm walking all around the store, and they're like you know, the record store day stuff is here. And I'm like, that's it. Because there wasn't anything that I wanted, even non beetle related. And it was like, yeah, that's all we got. Yeah, it must be terrible to be stuck with a bunch of limited edition stuff that you can only get in certain stores. Yeah. What's wrong with them? Well, you know, <laughs> I, you, you'll find um, there's those, I don't know, specialty, really niche kind of releases that that I've every once in a while will stumble upon them in other stores and go, wow, this is record store day like 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. they still have it in, in the bins. But anyway. You know, Darren, I'm glad you brought up Best of Dark Horse because I forgot completely about right. that. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to have to look into that. And and for anyone watching, that's uh, like a compilation of various artists that were on yeah. the Dark Horse label. Yeah. It's not George's Best of Dark Horse album. And but, it was uh, also um, uh, Joe Strummer a release and Joe mm -hmm. Strummer's material now is on Dark Horse, right? I mean, a, a live EP, which mm. I, I got so much stuff that I don't even remember if I ordered it or not. I'll find out when <laughs> I'll find out when the truck backs up to my house and dumps everything in. Mm. Yeah. So we were um, trying to decide what to do for George's yard site, as uh, some of us would say, and um, came up. Ken came up, I think, with the idea of a uh, compilation to sort of give an overview of his work. And then we sort of tussled over what the rules would be and decided, I believe, that there were no rules. So <laughs> we each have our own rules <laughs> for our compilation. I have rules. Well, before we do that, I just wanted to say many is the time here on this show, and I know Darren's pointed it out, that George has never had a decent greatest hits compilation of any kind and so we've thought from time to time why not put together our own and mm -hmm. that's why we're doing doing it well well for this occasion we could do it for this or george's birthday or any time really but um yeah we haven't been happy with uh the best of george harrison you know uh, the best of dark horse let it roll right. i don't think any of them were really good compilations mm -hmm. And uh, we also think that he warrants more than just one CD. Yeah, definitely. Because this was hard. Yeah. I, I had a hard time doing this. Mm. Um, so yeah, he has a lot I mean, of good stuff. I mean, oh, the, yeah. best, the best of George Harrison was a farce, that album. 
Um, and the and Best of Dark Horse was nice, but it was just a portion of his career, and then it went out of print. And mm. uh, like you pointed out, Let It Roll, uh, songs by George Harrison was 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 a fine compilation but it just sort of didn't make any sense what is it what is this supposed to be you know mm. you, it, it was a one disc pure mccartney kind of thing it was hits and album tracks and everything kind of thrown you know you need a a a complete thorough best of george harrison compilation and uh, that's the premise of the show mm -hmm. And I think we were talking about the parameters, and I said, no parameters. Let this be Ken Michaels' ideal best of George Harrison, Darren's um, essential best of album, and what, what Alan would want to see released. So no, no rules except, I guess the only rule was the length of it would be two CDs. Mm -hmm. So... Which automatically makes it, you know, not not something that Capital slash Universal would do because our CDs, I'm sure, are packed to the 80 minute level, and there's no way they would do that because record companies tend not to do that. I'm just making a comment about record companies in general. Um, mm -hmm. So, who wants to go first? I don't mind. Okay. Okay, Ken. There you go. Okay. What I wanted to do was, um, unless you consider Wonderwall music and electronic sound as being, you know, part of the full catalog, which it is. I mean, I really love Wonderwall music, but I don't think I would include anything from that. And I know that Alan's pressing to get electronic sound mm -hmm. one or two of the tracks on a compilation like <laughs> there this. There are only two tracks. I said, yeah, one, <laughs> one or two. Um, but if you look at his at his catalog more from All Things Must Pass On, you really do have as far as studio albums, 10 albums, which is a decent sized catalog there. Plus you have the live albums too, um, Concert for Bangladesh and Live in Japan. So to me, maybe because it's so ingrained in me, I do believe that every compilation should have hits in it, essential hits. Um, and in this case, because you got two CDs to play with, a lot of album cuts that you feel are worth your while, or um, album cuts that I very well remember were played on the radio at the time that these albums came out. The problem is, with All Things Must Pass, I want to put half of it on there, yeah. <laughs> because it's so much great stuff. But um, these are the ones that I came up with, and I thought since there are 10 studio albums, the first CD would cover the first five, like through 33 and a third. And then the second CD would go from George Harrison through Brainwashed. Um, even though I think some people might think keep the first CD just the capital years and then <laughs> the second CD, you know, the Warner Brothers and uh, Dark Horse uh, music. But um, I wanted to split it in half that way. So the first CD, and I timed each one out, they're both around 77 78 minutes in length um the first cd would start with my sweet lord then what is life um because it was such a dynamite track that got loads of airplay and i think should have been a third single awaiting on you all i think should be on there beware of darkness i would put on there because i think that's a song that really has been recognized of uh, the album cuts on All Things Must Pass as a truly great song and a lot of people covering it more these days. And I also put on Isn't It a Pity, version one. I just think that's a classic right there. Um, then I included Bangladesh, but I thought put the live version on there from the concert for Bangladesh because it's so rocking. And to me, I do love the studio version. I love the single version, love everything about it, but the live version is just whenever I think of that song, I think of George closing the concert and the killer band that he had um, at the show. And uh, for historic reasons, I thought the live version should be uh, put on here. Then I've got from the Living in the Material World album, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, obviously. Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, which really should have been a second single from the album. 
And even though I love every song on that album, probably the title track, Living in the Material World, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, that is all to me is one of the greatest love songs ever written by anybody. But um, if I had to, you know, kind of trim it to just a few songs and remembering what radio played at the time, um, I would probably put the, the title track on there. Then I've got Dark Horse, So Sad, and Maya Love, all of which were played a lot on the radio when Dark Horse first came out. And I also I put um, Maya Love on there since George did it live on the 74 tour. Um, I decided against Ding Dong Ding Dong only because of the fact that I look at it as a seasonal record. And in some ways, you know, I wouldn't want Happy Christmas or a Wonderful Christmas Time to be on a Greatest Hits compilation. I know it's essential and I know they're both, you know, great songs. Uh, but if I'm putting on a compilation like this, I only kind of want to hear those songs when it's close to the end of the year anyway. So um, for that reason, I didn't put Ding Dong Ding Dong on there. Then I've got You, This Guitar Can't Keep From Crying. I had a tough time with Extra Texture because The Answers at the End is one of my favorite songs from him. But I just felt that with these other songs here, they deserve it maybe a little bit more. Um, I got Woman Don't You Cry For Me, this song, True Love, and Cracker Box Palace. And that all completes the first disc. I think it's a great way to end with Cracker Box Palace. So um, that's CD number one. And for the second disc, I've got Love Comes to Everyone, Blow Away, and Your Love is Forever from the George Harrison album. Then I've got From Somewhere in England, Blood from a Clone. I know Alan will be happy to hear me say that. <laughs> I know you like that song. Um, of course, All Those Years Ago has to be on there. And I put Faster because I do think it's a great song and was released as a single too. Um, then we've got Wake Up My Love, uh, Mystical One, Dream Away, um, and I thought might be might be nice to fit right in between that and Cloud Nine to put Shanghai Surprise in there, because even though I have a tough time watching the movie, mm -hmm. I still love that song. And, uh, you know, I love the sound of George's vocals with Vicky Brown on there. And I, I really like the whole arrangement of the song. I love those few moments when George was getting into, you know, Oriental music, like Breath Away from Heaven and, you know, Shanghai Surprise. Then we move, move on to the Cloud Nine album. And I've got the title track to Cloud Nine, Got My Mind Set on You, When We Was Fab, This Is Love and Devil's Radio. So it's very well represented there. Five songs there. Then I've got Cheer Down, which I think is absolutely essential. It's one of my favorite from that period and incredible slide guitar work from George. And then we'll end with Any Road, Stuck Inside a Cloud, Rising Sun, and as a nice touch at the end, one song, that hasn't been released well to the general public, uh, Flying Hour, which was left off of somewhere in England, but included on the, the Genesis publications book, Songs by George Harrison. It's a song that really should have been included on somewhere in England. And I always felt that that song could have been somewhat of a hit had it been released at all as a single, a follow-up single to all those years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a pretty good representation right there. You got all the major hits, really. You got some minor hits and a lot of album cuts and even a few songs in there that weren't on uh, George's albums. Good album. Yep. So anything you'd argue about or do you just think it's well, ridiculously no. similar to mine, um, except um, Faster was on George Harrison, wasn't it? Not on... Um... Didn't I say somewhere it was George Harrison? I think yeah, it's George somewhere Harrison. in England. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> like, yeah. Faster is definitely, yeah, you're right. I should have placed that before all those years ago then. All right. I was I was, I was taking some songs out, adding some songs in. Yeah. So yeah. I just didn't have it all in perfect chronological order here. But yeah, Faster would be after, well, before Blood from a Clone. 
if you want mm -hmm. to put it after your love is forever or after blow away mm -hmm. your love is forever is such a killer love song <laughs> yeah so i had to put that in there yeah a lot of good stuff i mean you you you, you had a bunch that i didn't have but you had like whole bunches in the same order <laughs> that oh, i had okay. and I'm, I'm reading along and saying yeah i hope he has some different ones at some point or else there'll mm -hmm. be no point my reading mine but um Darren? All right. Well, um, <laughs> our our albums, Ken, uh, were very similar, uh, very similar times. And then uh, I think the differences came uh, with maybe some of the deeper songs that we picked, mm -hmm. uh, the right. deeper tracks. So basically how I approached this was uh, two CDs would be uh, four LPs. And two cassettes, because <laughs> I'm going to manufacture cassettes. Um, and it would be, it ended up being 38 songs. And what I did was, when I'm buying a compilation of an artist, an album that's being presented as a best of, I really want to keep it to the best of. Um, or greatest hits. Um, I sometimes don't like when compilations get into the nitty gritty and deeper tracks or alternate mixes of stuff like that because I feel like for the person looking for the um, uh, a starter or a sampler mm -hmm. uh, I, I like keeping those simple now if they put out a George Harrison uh, a best of now I would probably be annoyed that there aren't any you know, remix tracks or or B sides or the kinds of things that I avoided in putting my list together. I put I took this as being an opportunity to put together truly the best of George Harrison, if possible, every single. I didn't succeed in that. Um, every key album track, kind of going by what you went by, Ken. Did I hear this on the radio? Um, um and ended up really i guess i lucked out with a pretty easy list that as i went chronologically and chose the songs when all was said and done i had myself uh two cds filled and i got very anal about the timing mm -hmm. you know so i kept in mind that we don't want to pack too much onto one side of a of an lp so we didn't sacrifice sound quality so I tried to keep it in the vicinity of 20 minutes per album side. And I knew that you really can't supposedly go beyond or get near 80 minutes for CD. And using that as uh, I was still able to really put together a 38 song collection. Um, my first CD uh, clocks in at 78 minutes and 19 seconds. And CD, that's CD one. And CD2 clocks in at 77 minutes and 21 seconds uh, with, um, I don't know if this is making annoying my notes here. I don't know with the microphone. I apologize though if this wrap, paper rattling is annoying. Um, my album sides all kind of gravitated between uh, 1857, uh, 17 minutes, a couple went beyond 20. Anyway, the songs. Uh, pretty evenly distributed throughout all of the studio albums. I stayed away from Wonderwall music, mainly because I couldn't figure out what would be the track that would be the good rep, you know, that would be a, a good representative of, of Wonderwall music. None. You need to probably have several of them, and it wouldn't work, I think, on a best of uh, album. And of course, obviously, uh, if we were talking three or four CDs, I might do an edit of one of the two electronic soundtracks just to have a complete overview. But so like Ken, I started with All Things Must Pass. And we start off uh, CD one, side one, uh, four songs, all from All Things Must Pass. And I did try to thematically kind of fit songs, what would sound good opening a side Closing aside, opening a CD, uh, we start with My Sweet Lord, uh, follow it with uh, the first version of Isn't It a Pity, 
uh, then what is life? And side one ends with beware of darkness. We pretty much were in complete agreement there, Ken. Mm. Um, a fifth song, All Things Must Pass, the only album that I picked five tracks from. We start side two of the album with the title track. Uh, so I went with All Things Must Pass and really could have kept going, but knew, you know, there had to be a limit somewhere. So I stopped at that point and then chronological order, the studio version of Bangladesh, uh, simply because as a collector, I would want, you know, the, what I guess would be the rarer version now, because I would imagine more people have the concert for Bangladesh album with the live version than they have the single or the crappy best of George Harrison album. <laughs> uh, right. Or, and I don't even know if that's, it's probably somewhere else. But I put the studio version of Bangladesh uh, as the second song on side two. And then we go to give me, uh, then we go to living in the material world. I wanted to put four songs uh, from living in the material world, but that was the only kind of like compromise I had to make was that I, I dropped a fourth tune. And so only three songs from living in the material world the big hit, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. The should have been a single, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long. Mm -hmm. Side two of the album ends with the title track, Living in the Material World, which I remember hearing on the radio, FM radio, a lot um, mm -hmm. when that came out. So we're very close there, Ken, you and me, on my first record. Um, over to record two, side three opens up with the first of two songs from dark horse the title track uh and i did go with ding dong ding dong because it was a charting single it cracked the top 40 in the u.s uh it's i know what you're saying about like if we were doing lennon putting happy christmas war is over or or putting a mccartney compilation putting wonderful christmas time ding dong ding dong is sort of a borderline christmas tune more of a i'd think of it more of a celebratory new year's song and and really wouldn't stand out as much on my compilation we move on from dark horse two songs from that album also mm -hmm. two songs from extra texture read all about it you obviously uh the only charting single from the album and then i went with this guitar can't keep from crying as my second song uh because that did come out mm -hmm. as a single and seven people bought that single. <laughs> um, I wanted to put the answers at the end. I was contemplating, uh, I forget now, uh, but I thought, you know, Extra Texture is one of those albums that um, I love it, but it's what I feel is his weakest studio album. And I, I got to keep it to two. If I can go back and add a track, I will. And... Um, so what do I leave off? You, this guitar can't keep from crying. I would have liked to have ended the side there, but had some extra time. So we jumped to 33 and a third. Uh, the first of four songs from 33 and a third. Uh, this song closes side three of the album. And then you get uh, uh, side four, uh, which comes after side three. And I thought that was very important because I hate when side four comes after like, anyway. So side four, we start off with with Crackerbox Palace, uh, the other hit single from 33 and the third. Um, what I think should have been a single and would have been a hit, George's version of True Love. Uh, I thought about doing covers and I thought, eh, why? why? Why exclude them? And I've always thought True Love was a hit that wanting a song that wanted to be a hit. And the fourth song from 33 and a third is another one that I think should have been a single and a hit, Beautiful Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do remember hearing Beautiful Girl, 76 FM rock radio. I would have been listening at that time to WPLJ in New York City. And I, and I, I do remember hearing Beautiful Girl a lot. And I think I did think it was a hit, you know, back in the day. Uh, and then side four ends with two songs the first of two songs from the George Harrison album. First of uh, the first two of four. Four songs from George mm -hmm. Harrison. Blow Away and then side four of my album. 
and disc one ends with love comes to everyone so that's cd one you know you joke about um whether side four comes after side three or not but i don't know if you remember back in the vinyl days there were some companies that used to put out two disc sets that had sides one and four on yep. one disc and two and three on the other so that if you yep. put it on a changer you could yeah. Oh. I remember that. I remember that because like when I was really, really young, my dad's record collection really fascinated me. And musically, it was all over the map from from Barbara Streisand albums and Frank Sinatra to Montavani, a couple of Santana albums in there. He had a bunch of double albums. And I remember always understanding why they were done that way, because my dad would stack them mm -hmm. three or four. I'd get mad at him because I'd be like, Dad, you can't, you got to put them in order, all side ones. And, but uh, yeah, I, I was, somebody on Facebook about another album was wondering why that was done. And uh, today it's a pain in the neck when you pull out an old double album uh, that. Because uh, who uses a changer today? No one uses a changer. I mean, it's now we know that's the worst thing you could do for your records. Right. You stack them like that. And then, and then they drop and spin on top of each other so uh, grinding okay. the dirt into the one on the bottom so that was cd1 uh records one and two and cassette one now we go to the <laughs> second half of the album uh cd2 side five opening with faster which i think was a single but not in the u.s i don't think i think it was like a 12 inch or something no uh, it was a single in europe i think yeah. And Faster was my favorite song from George Harrison when the album first came out. Um, so Faster open side five. And then If You Believe is the fourth and final song off the George Harrison album. That's Love another that. one that I think has single written all over it. But if it did come out as a single, it came out in some obscure country. Not that uh, I, know. I don't think it did. Uh, and then uh, side five will wrap up with the three songs I chose from somewhere in England, uh, an album that I was willing to drop to two songs, but uh, all those years ago, of course, has to be there. Teardrops, which was the second single from the album. And I closed out side five with Save the World because of the message and the Greenpeace angle. And I know there was a Greenpeace album that came out. Mm -hmm. that had a remix of Save the World. So in a way, it's a song that was somewhat important. And um, in this day and age of trying to go as green as we can, Save the World, I think, uh, should be heard more. So I chose that as my third and final song from somewhere in England. Over to side six of the album, three songs coming from Gon Trapo. Um, Mystical One is the one I chose to open side six. Dream Away next and totally agreeing with Ken, Wake Up My Love, uh, which was the single, first single um, off the album. So those are my three from Gone Trapo. Then I start having a little fun. Uh, next, the single mix, because I understand there are two different versions of the Bob Dylan song, I Don't Want to Do It, mm -hmm. from Porky's Revenge from 1985. The soundtrack version differs uh, from the single version. I get totally confused on which version is what, but I went with the single version. It did come out as a single on Columbia Records with uh, a Dave Edmonds song on the other side. Right. Uh, and I remember at WFUV in 1985, we had the 12 inch single, uh, and that song got a lot of airplay on FUV. I Don't Want to Do It, an obscure Dylan song that actually has its roots going back to the tail end of the 60s and the old things must pass sessions um true and i've never seen the movie porky's revenge and i actually don't <laughs> plan on it so <laughs> uh and then uh, side six of the album closes out with the first of the four songs i picked from cloud nine um when we was fab and side six ends with this is love uh, and then we go over to side seven. This is the fourth and final record uh, of my collection. Devil's Radio kicks off mm. uh, side seven. And then 
Got My Mind Set on You closes Cloud Nine, and it's the final Cloud Nine song on my best of. Now, the next two songs, Poor Little Girl and Cockamamie Business, are the lost, excuse me, lost songs from Best of Dark Horse, 1976 to 1989. Uh, and those are great songs, and uh, they were in hits. Uh, they're as deep as you can get when it comes to album cuts, but they were on his second best of album and we want them back uh, available. So those are the two songs to close outside seven. Mm -hmm. And now we go over to the eighth side and we conclude my best of with Cheer Down, which Ken picked uh, from the Lethal Weapon 2 soundtrack. Two songs from Brainwashed. My only problem with Brainwashed has always been I find it very sad to listen to, knowing that George was dying when a lot of the album, or at least a good portion of the album was recorded and came out after his passing. And then it was an album that I also found, found it hard to find a lot of tracks that rose to the top as being can't miss no brainers for a best of. So I played it safe and picked any road and stuck inside a cloud. And I had enough time for one more song or two short songs. And I thought, we'll end where we started with My Sweet Lord 2000 from the All Things Must Pass uh, 30th anniversary reissue. Um, it was, I guess, the last quote unquote new thing George released in his lifetime. I believe. While he was alive, yes. And uh, it was important enough to record again. It was important enough for George to do that song yeah. a second time. It did come out as a single. Um, and we started with uh, My Sweet Lord and we end with the 2000 version, kind of making it cyclical there. And that's my best of album. Uh, the Essential George Harrison. All the key tracks are there and all the key album tracks and a handful of lost tracks that are key. Excellent. Excellent choices. Yeah. A, a lot of thought, especially oh. being put into the vinyl. You know, what songs yeah. would lead off each <clears throat> side. You know, I love I the had, fact that you would start a side with Mystical One, something like that, which for me is a, is a great... I was going to actually yeah. stay away from chronological order. Sometimes... Certain acts, if uh, albums that uh, best of albums that stay in chronological order, they don't work as as listening to as a whole. Uh, a lot of box sets are like that, where they will start. And it makes sense, I guess. But if you want to throw uh, a box set in, uh, like those very, very early collections from the 80s, like Clapton's Crossroads or Dreams, the Allman Brothers Band, uh, those are box sets that really... You put it on CD one track one and you got to sift through the early period and it just doesn't work. George, it would have worked, but also chronological work as well. And it was a hell of a lot less work. So I did it chronological and it came together naturally and pretty easily. I just ended up with the, my first draft had a, uh, a nine minute eighth side of the record and, you know, I thought immediately about the concert for Bangladesh. The last side of that triple album is really only 11 or 12 minutes long. They could have fit a little more material on it. And I thought, all right, I'm just going to massage the tracks I picked out and uh, balance the length of each side. And uh, worked out nice, I thought. Mm -hmm. And Alan, what? Well, I, I would like to just say a few things. First of all, I think we all prefer to do this all chronologically but the only problem that poses is and i do love wonderwall music you can't start this compilation with a song yeah. from wonderwall music. no that you would be to, yeah, yeah, right. yeah i found I a mean, solution okay <laughs> <laughs> okay gat kirwani is going to be in in alan's list there i bet that was the but, and that was the other thing what track because you really would only want to pick one from even if you did two from Wonderwall music, which one, which two songs would be the best representatives, uh, make the best, you know, uh, you know, best selections for a sampler? I would say Red Lady Two. Yeah, definitely. Or, or Drilling a Home. 
but I couldn't start off a competition <clears throat> with drilling a hole. Yeah, you can't. You know? Yeah. My solution was to cheat. I'm following Universal's lead in including an EP. <laughs> okay. I, I thought of that. Actually. And my my EP is all instrumental stuff, and it begin, it has three tracks from Wonderwall music: Red Lady Two, Skiing, hmm. and Wonderwall to Be Here. Back here, honey. I thought. <clears throat> excuse me. I thought that that actually is a a good choice because I I kind of wanted something that had the Indian side of things. These are different. I mean, you know, skiing is, uh, you know, basically a rock track. You know, Wonderwall to be here was used as the soundtrack for the Apple promo film that they made in 1968 uh, for Paul to bring to California to show uh, to Capitol about what Apple was going to be about. Uh, includes footage of magic Alex with an oscilloscope as if it's an actual, you know, invention of his and also shows John and Paul basically <laughs> browbeating um, their publisher. Uh, it's very weird as a promo film, you know, but anyway, so Red Lady 2 skiing and Wonderwall to be here. Then Harry's on tour from Dark Horse that was originally in my compilation and I, and then I just thought, okay, fine. I'm going to make I'm going to make an EP that is the instrumental Harrison, <laughs> um, and then finally Marwa Blues from Brainwashed. Right, um, nice. I did think about doing an excerpt from uh, Electronic Sound. My problem with Electronic Sound is that um, having interviewed Bernie Krause, who helped him with it and whose name is on the cover but is sort of silvered out you can you can see a splash of silver paint and under it it says bernie kraus um so they sort of deleted him but not well enough that you can't see that he's there basically bernie kraus said that you know what electronic sound is was my showing george how to do how to work the synthesizer. Um, it's a demonstration, you know, and George is doing stuff. It's like, okay, you know, if you take this patch cord out of this module and put it in here, you get this kind of sound and George would do it. So he ended up with tapes of himself doing stuff and he edited them into an album. And I guess that counts, um, but, but, Bernie Krause was so bitter about this. I mean, he wrote a letter to Rolling Stone saying, well, it turns out that our idols do have feet of clay. You know, hmm. he was very upset about it. So I left that one off because um, George also seemed to have mixed feelings about it. You know, he he does his Alvin Lee quote of, you know, avant-garde, yeah, avant-garde clue, you know. So um, that is actually that and... Uh, live in Japan are the only things really that I left out. Uh, and live in Japan, the problem sort of was I, I looked for something I could have from there, but it was basically all Beatles stuff or old George stuff. And whereas Bangladesh is pretty close to the release of All Things Must Pass, this was more of a retrospective concert. And it just, I, it, unless I wanted to put piggies or something on after cloud nine, if we're going chronologically, it just didn't seem to work. Mm. So going to the beginning, disc one, the first track, which by the way, is the title of the album, is what is life. Because my guiding principle here was, you know, I wanted the hits and I wanted tracks that I particularly like, but mainly I kind of wanted tracks that mostly showed the things that were important to George and what is life and everything on all things must pass. You know, this is his exploration of spirituality and asking and answering a lot of questions about what is life from a basically Hindu perspective, which is what interested him at the time. And so I have a bunch of that throughout the sequence. So what is life? My sweet Lord, you can't not have my sweet Lord, but I don't have, isn't it a pity? Mm -hmm. uh, Wawa, 
<laughs> um, I included Wawa, you know, we're already stepping away from the spiritual thing. And Wawa was the song that he wrote the day he quit the Beatles. Okay. Um, so that is a significant track, you know, in his or in his biography, in a way. So that's in there. Um, then Beware of Darkness, we're back to the spiritual thing and Art of Dying. So that's the uh, the All Things Must Pass section, except for Awaiting on You All, which I took from the concert for Bangladesh because uh, it's a really good performance. And the same with Bangladesh itself. I went back and forth between wanting to include the single because it's relatively rare and wanting to include the live version from the concert for Bangladesh. And basically the concert for Bangladesh just seemed to me to be a more powerful performance. And okay. so I went with it that way. <clears throat> then on to living in the material world, give me love, give me peace on earth, a big hit from it, can't not have it. And it's something he felt strongly about. Uh, don't let me wait too long. We're back to the God stuff. Living in the Material World, the, the title track, and then the Lord loves the one that loves the Lord. You know, again, mm -hmm. that theme. From Dark Horse, um, I didn't have a problem including Ding Dong, Ding Dong. Um, I listened to that all year. <laughs> okay. And I don't really think of it as, I mean, I understand it's really more like a New Year's song, you know, ring out the old, ring in the new is the first couple of lines. Um, but other than that, you know, unlike wonderful Christmas time or happy Christmas, which are about a specific holiday and a specific holiday that has one particular, you know, religious appeal, but ring out the old ring in the new, everyone celebrates New Year's, you mm -hmm. know, so I thought, fine, um, ding dong, ding dong, then the title song, Dark Horse, Figured, you know, you have to have that because, you know, it became the title of the name of his label and it was the title of the album. It, it has to have uh, meant something to him. Uh, and I think he saw himself as a dark horse in a lot of ways. Extra Texture uh, starts with you. And I included this guitar can't keep from crying, but I am considering, I, I have to look again at the timings. Uh, I, I have a few minutes extra on this disc. It's uh, 77, 78 minutes. And the other one is 76 minutes. The question is whether to include the one from Extra Texture or the Platinum Blonde one. Now that's the rarer one. Mm. I, th I think probably the one on Extra Texture is the better recording really. Uh, so that's the one that I have here, at least provisionally. Then on to 33 and a third, this song, you have to have this song again in the George Harrison biography. Uh, we've got the lawsuit that uh, that My Sweet Lord engendered, uh, which has its outcome in this song. Then True Love. Um, I don't know why. I just really like the song. It's a Cole Porter song, I think. Uh, yep. and obviously appealed to him. You know, he's got a lot of these He's got a lot of these sort of standards, um, oldies in his discography, Hong Kong Blues, Baltimore Oriole. Um, there's one on Brainwashed, what was it? Um, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. Yeah. Um, so I, I also really like the video of, of True Love. So that's on there for that reason. I think he does a good job of it. Uh, Cracker Box Palace and Tears of the World. And that's the end of disc one. Hmm. <clears throat> so disc two begins with, we go on to the George Harrison album and I've got five from that. Love Comes to Everyone. Soft-Hearted Hannah, it's about mushrooms, you know? So <laughs> I just thought it would be good to have in there. Uh, Blow Away, great song faster you know he was a racing car fanatic and that comes out also in the video for that song have to have faster so that's there and and then if you believe because mm. we're back to the that side of george uh somewhere in england uh don't have a lot from that i have all those years ago i i didn't do blood from a clone i tried to fit it but um Lots of reasons, as Ken knows, that I would have wanted to have it, but, um, you know, it just... I'm surprised. Yeah, I know. 
Um, and the second one from somewhere in England, uh, Save the World, I was going to use the Greenpeace remix because that's on a Greenpeace compilation. It's um, probably hard to find today. I don't know. I haven't seen it around except on my shelf. So um, so I would use that one. I mean, they're, they're both good mixes. Uh, the arrangement is pretty different here. They, they, they start completely differently. Uh, and I think that just because it's not heard as much, uh, that's the one I would go with. So on to Gontropo. Tropo. Uh, that's the way it goes. Nice. Then the title track, um, Wake Up My Love would have been a good choice too. The title track sort of has this undercurrent of humor that I associate with George. And I'm not sure has come through too many of these. There's a little bit. I mean, really it's in Ding Dong Ding Dong too. And and some others, but it's a bit clearer maybe in Gontrapo. And then Dream Away. Mm -hmm. then hmm. I really thought I was going to be the only one to include I don't <laughs> want to do it <laughs> but here's Darren <laughs> so I included the single version of I don't want to do it which and is then, there's a difference one has a guitar solo or there's a guitar bit and another one has an organ which I think Chuck Levelle played hmm. Mm. Uh, and I, I never got, I never got it down. Which, which version? The soundtrack album version and, and, uh, and the single version. But I won't the single. I, even though I tend to prefer album, 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 album. I'm not a single guy. There's so many things Rhino Records has put out over the years that you load those with single. I don't, I hate that. But in this instance, for collecting purposes, I went with the single. I right. think the single version is the one with more guitar. <laughs> If I, it's been a while since I listened to both versions. Hey, so Cloud Nine, the title track, This Is Love, When We Was Fab, mm -hmm. have to have that. And Got My Mind Set on You, another one of his covers we were just talking about. Um, although it, this one isn't quite Cole Porter era. No. Um, um, I wanted to include something from the Wilburys. So I included Handle with Care because it begins with George singing it. And I looked on on Will the Wilburys three, their second album, and all the songs that I would have wanted to choose because I like the song start with either Tom Perry or Bob, Petty or Bob Dylan. So I decided, OK, we can just have one Wilburys track and that's going to be uh, Handle with Care. Um, I also chose Cheer Down. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought of it as a single. Um, I have it on a CD single, but it may be a promo only CD single. It may not have actually been released as a single. What, Cheer Down? Right. Yeah. No, I have it too. It was? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have it. I have the promo as well. Yeah. And then finally from Brainwashed, I chose Any Road and The Rising Sun. I thought The Rising Sun was a great way to close the album philosophically um, because in a way, you know, at the end of the album, the sun's setting theoretically, but here it's, it's rising. And uh, I think along with, uh, you know, what is life as the opener, rising sun just seemed to be uh, sort of philosophically upbeat in a way. And, and it's the way I wanted the whole set to be. I didn't want too much dirgy stuff. And um, so, so those are the ones I chose. Plus then of course, there is my instrumental EP, which I've already told you about. Which I had also Ooh. thought about adding a bonus disc sort of like that. Well, I you know, when we do time. these, when we do these lists, we almost always have, you know, and then, but I also had these alternative ones and, all that, <laughs> and I thought, okay, you know, if, if chances are that's going to happen again. So I'm just going to have an EP. <laughs> it's going to get thrown in. Let's say it's free for, uh, with, with the two CD set. I thought of doing like an, 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 a deluxe version and a standard version and the <laughs> deluxe version, having a third CD that would be maybe all live stuff. Mm, yeah. uh, but you know i figured you know like i said at the beginning i'm going to go with what is the essential of the essential best of a great starting 
place for someone who does not have any George Harrison music because that album as of right now in reality doesn't exist. And, you know, for yeah. um, as much as we've uh, maligned the capital best of George Harrison, um, I do think that his Beatles era stuff deserves a compilation disc as well, in a way. We, we, the one rule that we had was that this would be solo George Harrison and, and none of his Beatles stuff. But, you know, if you look at the whole run of them from Don't Bother Me on to something and Here Comes the Sun, it's a pretty good collection of songs. You know, yeah. he didn't he didn't get much time on each album, but they sort of made him use it as well as you possibly could use it. And there's definitely, I think there's definitely enough for an, a, a whole album there, really. You've got four on the White Album, three on Revolver, yeah. um, two on Abbey Road. So it's good. That's stuff. a great idea. That's a great idea. There really should have been just one disc of, you know, the best of George from the Beatle years. There's so much good stuff there. And the mere fact that we're saying you want an EP of instrumentals or a third disc tells you how strong the solo catalog was. That's right. I was I was wrestling with, should I put Wilburys on there? And I would only want to put a Wilbury song on there if it was just a George lead vocal. Although, hey, I put Shanghai Surprise on mine. But... <laughs> um yeah, I also thought if you're going to put Handle with Care on there, um, Heading for the Light would be a really good choice because it's mainly just George and Jeff Lynn. Right. It's not all the members sharing lead vocals or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but these are really interesting compilations that we put together. I don't know if I necessarily would put certain tracks on just because they're out of print, just to keep them in print. Because something like Poor Little Girl and and um, Cockamamie Business, uh, believe me, I love those songs. I don't know if they would represent the best of, in my mind. But you have your own criteria for putting that stuff on. Same thing with I Don't Want to Do It. That was why I didn't include something like Miss Odell, you know. Would have wanted to include Miss Odell because we all like Chris, you know, it's about yeah. her. Um, but it's not like up there among his really best stuff. And the same with I Don't Care Anymore, another B-side mm -hmm. that never gets played. So A lot of people love Deep Blue. That's as true. As I, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Deep Blue is, I really like Deep Blue too. I should have included it. And it's well. interesting because Darren and I, we both used to listen to WPLJ mm -hmm. in New York City. So we know what they played on the air. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, certainly through... 33 and a third i don't think so much about the george harrison album they went into album cuts yeah on george you they know, were and, they yeah. were formatted actually which we you know now looking back and uh plj i think was the first at least new york city station fm rock station where they thought about formatting it and kind of taking putting pushing away the free free format concept and if I remember correctly, the album that really uh, stands out is Wings at the Speed of Sound. And we talked about this. Oh, yeah. You know, I remember it being maybe four or five songs from the album, but only those songs that got played in a, you know, in a, um, you know, like they, were singles. like they were singles. Yeah. You could now I think back and I'm like, I could tell there was there was a there was a plan there. Now knowing what I know today. Wings at the Speed of Sound, they played just about every song mm. from the album. And WPLJ is just a very interesting station because it came around at a time when, uh, you know, formats weren't specialized as they are now. And in the very beginning, what they call the rock station, they mm. played a lot of stuff that wasn't what we would consider rock today. They played a lot of pop stuff. They played Barry Manilow on the station. They played um, a lot of R&B. They played Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and the ISC Brothers and Earth, Wind and & Fire. And all that was accepted on a rock station. Believe me, I used to listen I religiously that. to that station. Yeah. So it's really what sold. It, it, it was in some ways close to top 40 in that respect with all the variety that they hate, that they had on the station. Um, you know, that and, got me into Al Stewart. And I don't think Al Stewart was getting, I don't know how much 
airtime he was getting like an, on WNEWFM or whatever other rock station might have been around in the middle 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember vividly they had him, uh, Al Stewart, on the morning, morning drive uh, in the studio. And they would always use his description of what the song Year of the Cat was about and play it over the introduction of the song. Uh, and, you know, Al Stewart is and isn't the kind of artist that you would think was getting played on a rock radio station. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, but you know what I'm saying? You could go either way with that. Okay, so that is our tribute to George Harrison and uh, our idea of what a great George Harrison two-disc best of set would be, or three ideas with a lot of overlap. <laughs> uh, so, Ken, why don't we uh, give our contact information and start with Ken. All right, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I do have my own YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. And as I said earlier, I just did an interview with Joe Thomas, who's the producer of Ringo Starr and his all-star band, Live at the Greek Theater, 2019. Mm -hmm. He did the audio and the video, talks all about that. And uh, really a wonderful interview, sharing insights on what it was like to work with Ringo and to do all that creative work on both the audio and video end. My other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show on Ringo's Old Wave album and did our own critique all these years later. Um, and we're going to be doing a show in two weeks, which is going to be part, our uh, top three, I think, highlights of, of the year. And we're going to review Ringo's Christmas album, um, which I think just hasn't gotten enough attention through all these years. I mean, it's great that we have Happy Christmas. It's great that we have wonderful Christmas time. And even the Christmas song from, from Paul, but Ringo is the only Beatle that commercially put out a Christmas album. Oh, wow. So we're going to be talking about that on the next Talk More Talk, which airs every other Monday night at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. So uh, the next show will be uh, December 12th, I believe. Monday night, 9 p.m. on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out and uh, subscribe to that. There's always my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, which has weekly Beatles trivia where you can now win. I just mentioned it. This is the double CD of Ringo Starr and his all-star band live at the Greek Theater 2019. And I also just want to mention that um, I was on two other podcast shows talking about my love of radio, how I was brought up on radio and uh, how I wanted to pursue a career in radio and also the Beatles. And uh, I'm on a show called Call Me Mr. Broadstreet, which is hosted by Ed Crawford. He has his own YouTube channel with that name, Call Me Mr. Broadstreet. And Ed Rising uh, has his podcast show, Popomatic Podcast is what it's called. Um, we also talk about my fascination with the charts the music charts through the years, the singles and the albums. And on Ed, Ed Rising show, the Papamatic podcast, because we seem to love well-crafted pop, and I know that Ed is a big Partridge Family fan and David Cassidy fan, we, do, we have a discussion about the Partridge Family there. In fact, I didn't even ask a trivia question, which has a Partridge Family and Beatles connection. Should I throw it at you guys? Yeah. All right. Wes Farrell, who was the producer of the TV series and wrote many of the songs that the Partridge family did, actually has a bit of Beatle history. Act naturally. You're close. Wasn't he a co-writer of that? No. Hmm. Hmm. I think he was a co-writer of something they did. Yes, you're you're <laughs> warm. You're warm. Something of Beatles for sale? No. I'll just I'll just tell you. Um, he was one of the writers for the song Boys. Okay, right. Dixon Farrell. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there you go. So um Beatles and Partridge family in one show. <laughs> it was something Ringo said. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Ringo's keeping that song alive and all of his mm -hmm. tours, he does it in every single tour. 
So, uh, yeah, you want to hear Beatles talk and Partridge Family talk and David Cassidy? We talked about that for a while. So uh, check out those two podcasts. And that's it. I was a Sean Cassidy fan in the mid-70s. Really? Hmm. Nothing wrong with that. I had it. I liked albums. Hey Deanie. Hey Deanie. Hey cool Deanie. Yeah. I had his Eric. first two albums on tape. And a few years ago, Record Store Day reissued Wasp, which was, I think, his last album that I uh-huh. think Todd Rundgren produced. He did. He attempted a serious kind of new agey sort of rock record. Not mm. new age, new wavy sort of rock record. And it came out on vinyl and Record Store Day some years ago. So I was the one person who bought that. Okay, so tell us how to get in touch with you, and you can make us so that you can make us a tape. <laughs> um, you can email me at WFUV if you want to email me directly, Darren DeVivo or D DeVivo, I believe also works at WFUV.org. Or really, the best way is Facebook, all over Facebook with two pages, Darren DeVivo, where you could send me a friend request, uh, or the other page, just click follow or like or whatever is there uh and that is uh darren devivo wfuv dj and beatles podcaster something like that's the name of it um and the content on both pages is very similar but uh i leave some of the personal stuff off um the uh, radio podcast page uh so look for me there and if you want to listen on the radio i hope you do uh you can uh listen uh, in the New York City metro area, 90.7 FM. I'm on the air Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights starting at 10 till 2 a.m. And Saturday, 1 to 4 in the afternoon, right before Mixed Bag, Pete Fornital's old show hosted by Don McGee. Saturdays at 4. I'm on before that. So check that out. Alan? Okay, you can reach me through Facebook. I have two Facebook pages, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, We also have two Facebook pages for the three of us, uh, Things We Said Today, as you might guess, and Things We Said Today, Beatles radio fans. The shows are always posted on both of those and or links to links to the YouTube version of the show are always posted on both of those. Uh, I also uh, you might want to check in on the McCartney Legacy Facebook page as well. Um, as we get close to the thing actually coming out, we're posting more things. Uh, Adrian is having a raffle uh, for a charity for a children's hospice in England for only two pounds you can have a chance to win one of three autographed copies of the book. I will include the link to the page for that raffle in the uh, write-up write up of the show uh, or in the comments. Uh, let's see. You can email all of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. I'll read it again because it's so long. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab. Um, we hope you're watching the YouTube version um, because you could have seen Ken hold up the Ringo album at least three times and you get to see my guitars and stuff. You know? uh, <laughs> Darren's video game collection. And you Which also, that's my, my son. Yeah. <laughs> and you also get to see how I write backwards. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the benefits yeah many many benefits um but if you don't want to be glued to your screen we do have the audio only version which is on podbean and podbean distributes to iHeartRadio and apple ipodcasts and everything else so we're pretty easy to find can we just remind everybody our next show is actually going to be with you and adrian Okay. Talking about the McCartney legacy. We're planning on recording it on December 8th, and hopefully it'll be out there on the 9th. Yep, that's true. So, lots of information from the, that McCartney book, which we <laughs> I've been digging it. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Okay, so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen, and thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. 